Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke in the New Testament, chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is God's word. Susie Spurgeon, wife of the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon, shared the following story in a biography about her husband. We went together in a cab, and I remember trying to keep close by his side as we mingled with the mass of people thronging up the staircase. But by the time we had reached the landing, he had forgotten my existence. The burden of the message was upon him, and he turned into the small side door where the officials were waiting for him, without for a moment realizing that I was left to struggle as best I could with the rough throng around me. At first I was utterly bewildered, and then I was angry. I returned home and told my grief to my gentle mother. She wisely reasoned that my husband was no ordinary man, that his whole life was dedicated to God, and that I must never hinder him. Quietly he let me tell him how indignant I had felt, and then he repeated mother's little lesson, pointing out that before all things... He was God's servant. I read this story 20 years ago when I was in seminary. I remember swelling with pride, hoping one day I would be like the mighty Spurgeon, no ordinary man, my whole life dedicated to God with a wife who knows I must never be hindered and before all things, God's servant. Now I think about this story much differently. It makes me sad. And the reason is the story Luke tells about Jesus, God's true servant and the widow from Nain. We don't even know her name. She's just a widow from Nain. Luke is the only gospel writer who includes her story. I'm curious if you notice the similarities. In both, there is a large crowd, a frightened woman, and a religious teacher. But it's the differences that are significant. Spurgeon ignores the frightened woman. His wife gets sucked into the crowd all for the sake of a sermon. Jesus doesn't even have a sermon to give. He ignores the crowd all for the sake of a frightened widow, someone he hadn't even met before. This is the next story in our series, Faces of Affliction, Heralds of Hope. It's a short story. The hinge occurs when Jesus sees a face of affliction and moves toward her. The story ends with Luke observing how this news about Jesus spread. Surely the widow was one of many heralds of hope. That's the hinge in the ending. The story begins as two large crowds located at opposite ends of the emotional spectrum collide outside the town gate. One crowd is following Jesus, full of anticipation and joy at what he might say or do next. The other is a funeral procession gathered around her, full of grief and sorrow at such a tragic loss of life. Despite the number of people surrounding him, Jesus appears to see only one person, the most desperate and needy person in the story, which reveals so much about Jesus. He has eyes only for the widow, whose only son has died. Luke writes, When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. I've been married over 20 years, and as beautiful as this reads, I can also tell you on pretty good authority that telling a woman not to cry when she is already crying is not the wisest thing to do. She would have had no idea who Jesus was. He shows up out of nowhere, surrounded by a large, jovial crowd, Don't cry. We don't know how this made her feel. We don't even know if she responded. This is a story about death. 
It's also a story about resurrection and a story about life. And here's a teaser to keep you engaged. It's not just a story about the life of the one that Jesus raises from the dead. A good question to begin is how many dead people are there in this story? At first glance, it's one, the obvious one, the son of the widow. He's the one dead in a coffin. But look deeper, and there's another. Luke tells us that this is a son of a widow, which means her husband had also died. That's two, two significant, grievous, heart-wrenching losses that she has experienced. Her loss is so great, in fact, that the most compelling answer to the question, how many dead people are there in this story, is actually three. Because this is not only the son of a widow, this is the only son of this widow. And in this ancient cultural context, without husband or son, though she's technically alive, she would have felt dead on the inside. Perhaps now more than ever, you can relate to her, what she must have felt like, a dead woman walking. In her book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, therapist Lori Gottlieb writes, People often mistake numbness for nothingness, but numbness isn't the absence of feelings. It's a response to being overwhelmed by too many feelings. Brene Brown recently interviewed David Kessler on her podcast, Kessler is an expert on grief, and he says something so simple, but it makes Brown gasp. The worst suffering is yours. Don't ignore yours, even though the widow's is so great. Instead, know that Jesus sees and hears. His heart always goes out to those who are suffering, and that includes us all. The worst suffering you know is yours. The emotion that Luke is trying to capture deep within Jesus' soul is compassion. This is also the emotion that Jesus most often felt. My favorite definition comes from one of my heroes, Frederick Buechner. Compassion is the sometimes fatal capacity for feeling what it's like to live inside somebody else's skin. Of course, in Jesus' case, compassion is not sometimes a fatal capacity but a fatal capacity. The second thing to observe about death in this story occurs when Jesus touches the coffin. Luke notes, he went up and touched the coffin they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. They stood still, and everyone else would have stood silent as this carpenter turned rabbi touches death, which would have made him unclean. The Old Testament book of Numbers records, Anyone out in the open who touches someone who has been killed or someone who has died a natural death will be unclean for seven days. To feel the shock of this moment, imagine Jesus walking into a hospital and then onto the COVID floor with no gloves, no mask, no PPE. Little do they know And this brings us to the second point, that this is not just a story about death. It's also a story about resurrection. The dead son's uncleanness will not pass to Jesus. It won't affect him at all. It will not make him impure. Rather, Jesus' cleanness, his purity, his righteousness will turn the prevailing tide, transform the assumed trajectory, bringing death to life. Young man, I say to you, Get up, Jesus says, and then Luke writes, The dead man sat up and began to talk. How I wish we knew what he said. For three years, I served as a middle school chaplain and religion teacher at a private school in Atlanta, Georgia. I taught a world religions course to sixth graders that lasted six weeks. Every six weeks, I got two new groups of sixth graders. So by the end of the year, Every sixth grader in the school had cycled through my class. We discussed Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. For Christianity, one of the stories I always shared was this one from Luke 7, Jesus and the widow from Nain. At the end, I would ask, what is the most amazing thing that happens in this story? And they would always look back at me dumbfounded 
because the answer is so obvious. I would say, I know the guy that's dead at the beginning is no longer dead at the end. That is pretty amazing. But what if there's something else that happens in the story that is just as amazing as the son's resurrection? I would pause, let that sit for a while, and ask, anybody want to take a guess? What else happens in this story that is just as amazing as the son's resurrection? It's a phrase in the story itself, I would tell them. The text of the story was on a screen behind me. See if you can find it, and they would start guessing, searching for almost any phrase that might work. Jesus told her, don't cry. Jesus' heart went out to her. Jesus touched the coffin, and then they go to the end. They were filled with awe and praised God. God has come to help his people. No, I know the news about Jesus spread, and I would keep shaking my head saying, no, those are wonderful and interesting things, but not what I'm looking for. Not what I think is just as amazing as the son's resurrection. Like I said, I taught this class for three years, two sections of new students every six weeks, which means I taught this story to a room full of sixth graders a total of 36 times, and only one time did a student get it right on the very first try. I don't remember her name. I can still see her face. She was soft-spoken. I barely heard her because the others were shouting the responses I already shared with you. I faintly heard her say, Jesus gave him back to his mother. And I stopped. Who said that? And I scanned the room to find her sitting there with a sheepish smile on her face. Our eyes locked and I said, yes, why? Why is it just as amazing that Jesus gives him back to his mother? And she proceeded to nail it because she was dead too. It's a story about death, a story about resurrection, and a story about life. But it's not just the life of the Son that Jesus raises from the dead. It's a story about her life too. Because not one, but two resurrections happen. The Son's is literal. He rises from a coffin. But hers is just as real. She rises from her grave. Paul Miller writes, When I think of how Jesus loved people, the word cherish comes to mind. When we cherish someone, we combine looking and compassion. We notice and we care. Jesus cherished this woman. He saw her. He cared for her. And when he gives her son back to her, as that precious sixth grade girl so powerfully observed, He raises her from the dead too. She will no longer feel dead, relegated to the margins as she walks back through the town gate of Nain. What is your grave? What grave do you right now long to be raised from? Emptiness, disappointment, exhaustion, loneliness, maybe the grave of addiction, no purpose, grief, the grave of poverty, job loss, sickness, broken relationships, deep longings you can't seem to ever feel. What's your grave? Jesus sees you. He sees you in your grave. His heart goes out to you in your grave, and He's able to do so much more than tell you, don't cry. Jesus has the power to raise you from your grave, and one day, your grave. Think about what Jesus could have done with the son. He could have told him to follow him. He'd done this before. That's why there's such a large crowd of people following him. But don't you see, if he had done that with him, his mother would have still been a dead woman walking. Jesus could have used him to benefit himself and his ministry, Hey, Peter, James, and John, let's make sure you add him and his story to the order of service in the next town. But he doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus gives him back to his mother because Jesus never, ever used anybody for his own benefit. In fact, on the cross, he will get used and abused for hours. Another one of my heroes, fellow Kentuckian and farmer, Wendell Berry, once wrote this little gem, 
as I have read the Gospels over the years, the belief has grown in me that Christ did not come to found an organized religion, but came instead to found an unorganized one. This is reminiscent of how the story ends. As the whole town of Nain, the entire community suddenly looks up and then they look out, giving us a picture of what it means to be a member of God's family. They look up, filled with awe, praising God, exclaiming God has come to help His people. And then they look out as this news about Jesus spreads all over the place. Friends, love of God and love of neighbor is always how the news of Jesus spreads. Once you see that Jesus sees you and His heart goes out to you, you won't be able to see anyone else ever the same again. Nor will you be able to contain your heart as it goes out to others just like His did. Let's pray. Jesus, may we see you seeing us. And may we know that your heart goes out to us like it did this precious widow. And as we see you seeing us, may we see others differently. And as we feel your heart coming out to ours, may our heart leap forward and think of others first instead of ourselves because of who we're following. In your name we pray. Amen.